Good morning, this is Scott Patterson, and welcome to our Sunday morning Bible class. You know, right now we're doing a study of the book of Colossians, and our text this morning is chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Now, our lesson next Sunday morning is actually going to pick up with verse 15, but I thought it would be really good today to go ahead and read through verse 15 to get the full context of some of the things that Paul is saying. Why don't we start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll read our passage and get right into our lesson. Let's bow. Our most heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much, Father, for your great love and your blessings, for the way that you're with us. And Father, we do sense your presence and are grateful for your presence and your watch care. There have just been so many answered prayers of late, so many good things that have happened. And Father God, we just are grateful to know that you're with us and just pray that we look to you even more and trust you even more, Father God, not just during this time, but for all time. Be with us as we get into this passage from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 15, and just go verse by verse and try to understand exactly what Paul is doing here and Get a better understanding both of what Paul was concerned about, but also, Father, your Son, and all the things that he is saying about your Son, and what we have in this relationship with you and your Son. I just pray for your blessing, pray that you'll be with us, and it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. So let me take a quick sip of tea. Little Earl Grey this morning. And uh, let's read together now our text. And again, it's Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. And I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Let's read. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority." And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Verses 14 and 15. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, that is, Christ. So, in our last chapter, Paul completed part of an explanation of the idea that is pretty much the central theme of Colossians. This idea that Christ is first, Christ is above, Christ is preeminent. All, above all, 
right? And, you know, I, I've read here by the author of our material that if you think about it, think about a chain from God to man. And in so many ways, what Paul is describing is the fact that Jesus is that chain and that he is every link within the chain, which is kind of the idea that every way that we could be connected to the Father, Jesus has something to do with it, and it's because of Christ. If we enjoy a relationship with our Heavenly Father, if we enjoy a connection with our Heavenly Father, if there is this wonderful, beautiful salvation that's been given from Him to us, everything that we enjoy is all because of Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus has a relationship to the Father because He's a part of the Godhead itself. He is linked to creation because he's the one that brought it into existence. He is the one who maintains its existence. And he's also the one who gave the purpose for its existence. And then he's linked to mankind because, again, he's our only hope of salvation. And the one who actually brought about that salvation through his sacrifice upon the cross. And then he's linked to all those who have been saved because he is the head of the body which is the church. Christ, again, if there's a link, a chain between the Heavenly Father and us, Jesus is that chain, and he is every link within that chain because every relationship, every kind of relationship we have with God and his people, it's all because of Jesus, all because of Jesus. So it's because of that that Jesus is first, Jesus, Jesus is preeminent above all things. You know, as I mentioned kind of at the outset of our study, we don't know all there is to know about Gnosticism, which was the particular false doctrine that they were dealing with there in Colossae, and Paul is writing to the Colossians about. But what we know as far as the effect of that false teaching is that it was lowering Christ. It was giving them a deficient view of Christ as God's Son, our Savior, as the Son of God. And Paul was so fearful that this false view of Christ would chip away at their belief in Christ himself. And so he felt this pressing need to write this letter to the Colossians and to deal with this false doctrine. Well, you know what Paul's going to do here in the second chapter is he's not only going to defend Jesus, but he's going to defend himself. As we noted, Paul was always, it seemed, always in this situation where he had to defend himself and his apostleship. Now, this is kind of a particular situation, a difficult challenge, because Paul's writing to a group of brethren that he's never seen. He didn't go to Colossae. He didn't start the church in Colossae, as we'll note later. And so he's trying to write with authority to a group of people whom he's never met and have only heard of him. So Paul's going to defend Christ and defend himself. Let's see what he has to say. Well, this is, by the way, this part of chapter 2 is part of a longer section from chapter 2 and verse 1 all the way over to chapter 3 and verse 4, where it talks about Christ being preeminent in doctrine, all these teachings about Christ, that uh, their importance and how we must hold to them and hold them dear in our hearts. This is what Paul is underscoring. So again, let's go back and let's read verses 1 through 3, if you will. In verses 1 through 3, we read, For I want you to know how great a struggle... I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea. Apparently, this doctrine had reached the church at Laodicea and was making its way through the church, and so Paul mentions them because they're dealing with this same thing. And he says, And for all of those I have this struggle who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, as we look at this and we begin to break it down, again, Paul is writing to people who didn't know him. Now, why was that? Well, Paul didn't establish the church in Colossae. Who did? 
we understand that Epaphroditus and Timothy established that church. And so, of course, they relayed Paul's teachings. They taught about Paul. Paul was a mentor to both of those men, both of those gospel preachers. And so they knew of Paul. They just hadn't met him. Now, where is Paul at this time? Well, Paul is in prison. And yet, I so admire Paul's heart, his concern for the church. You know, it's funny, he talks about it as a struggle. And I couldn't help but think of 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, where Paul says, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. He says just every day, I hear reports of churches and how brethren are doing and things that are happening here or there. And he says, I hear some good things and I hear some things that concern me. And I just feel so much pressure for the churches and for their faith and their salvation, that they'll hold on to that faith so they can experience salvation. He says, I just feel that pressure every single day. And he says, that's why I'm writing. It's born out of this struggle that he has. What a great heart. Sitting there in prison and yet worried about others. Worried about the church, even as he is suffering at that moment for the cause of Christ. In verse 2, Paul describes what the struggle was for. And he outlines some objectives that he, he desired for the brethren at Colossae, and we presume for other churches as well, even for us today. He says, there's some things I want to see happen. I want you to hold on to the faith, hold on to these teachings about Jesus so that these three things can happen. Now, what are these three things that were the objectives of his work, his ministry, and his desire for them and for us. He says, first of all, that he might be a source of encouragement to them. He says, the things that I've taught, the things that I'm writing now to you, he says, I want to be a source of encouragement. Don't we need encouragement? Always. We need to be encouraged to do the right thing, to keep on doing the right thing, and to stand with the truth, even when the truth is spoken against. To stand with our Lord, even as he's being rejected. We need encouragement. The word encourage means to literally give courage to another. And Paul says, that's what I want to do. I want to be that to you, the one who gives you encouragement. And then notice this. He says, also, my prayer is, or this, this desire is, that um, you will be knit together in love. That's a way of describing unity. And it's a very beautiful illustration, isn't it? This idea of knitting things together. You think about a sweater uh, where the strands are knit together, woven together so that they come together and form this, this one garment that serves such a beautiful function. Paul says, I look at the church with so many different strands, so many different people from so many different backgrounds, and that's my, my prayer, that you can be woven together like that as this beautiful garment of the Lord. And then he says something else. He says, I also pray for your full assurance of understanding. An assurance of understanding. That's maybe a euphemism for hope. A euphemism for hope. He just says, I, I pray that you're filled with hope. Hope that's grounded in the knowledge of and belief in Jesus Christ. The true revelation he says, Jesus, isn't that an interesting way, by the way, of describing Jesus? He says, you'll be grounded in this understanding, this true knowledge of God's mystery. Oh, yes. What's the mystery? He says, Christ. All the things that God was going to bring about, I mean, the promise from early on in Genesis that was fulfilled then in those days, he says, Jesus was God's mystery. And if we know him, we'll experience encouragement and loving unity and this real hope. That was Paul's desire. That's what he wanted to help bring about in the lives and the experience of the Colossians. Let's move on to verse 3. Look at verse 3 again. He says, In whom, talking of, about Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and and knowledge. Now, I think he's being very precise with those words, and he uses them for a reason. 
You see, Gnosticism, by definition, was all about saying that we have knowledge that you don't have. And because we have this knowledge, we're on a higher plane. We're more spiritual. We're holier than you are because we have this knowledge and this wisdom. And yet Paul's saying that, you know, the wisdom that you think you have, he's talking to the Gnostics, and the knowledge that you think you have is not the knowledge and the wisdom of God. But for those of us who know him, we're going to get this true wisdom and true knowledge. And he says it's like finding treasure. It's like finding a great treasure, something of great and wonderful value, not this earthly wisdom, right? That's based on human tradition and philosophy and false thinking, but the wisdom and knowledge of God that is truly a treasure for us. And he says there that, uh, again, verse the end of verse uh, 2 is, true knowledge of God's mystery in Christ himself, in whom are this uh, are the treasures of this wisdom and knowledge. Which is a way of saying that, you know, if we are in Christ, we have access to this, but also it's a way of saying that Jesus is this wisdom and knowledge. He personifies it. He embodies it. So the more, the more we know Jesus, the more we know and understand this knowledge and wisdom. Now let's get on to verses 4 and 5. Let's read them once more. He says, I say all this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Uh, let's look at those last two terms uh, there at the end of verse 5. He says, I rejoice that I do see your good discipline and your stability in the faith in Christ. Now, the idea of there being good discipline, I think he's talking about their personal discipline, the fact that they've kept according to what they've been taught. They've stayed in that, remained in that. And they're, they're, you know, Gnosticism was not only threatening to take people away from the truth, but Gnosticism taught some different things about the way we live out the truth and live the Christian life. It said that, you know, actually, the flesh is not as important, and so maybe you can go do some things as long as you're spiritual in your mind and in your heart. It's okay. You might do some things in your flesh that uh, others would say are ungodly, but as long as your heart and your mind, everything inside is right and good, it's okay. And Paul was saying, that is not okay. In fact, I'm very pleased with your good discipline. I mean, you're keeping to this message. You're staying in the faith. But also, you're living according to the way of Christ and after the example of Christ. And the stability of their faith. I like that. You know, there are always things that try to pull us away from the message of the gospel. From the truth about Jesus Christ. From the truth about salvation. There are always these things that try to pull us away from those core teachings of the gospel. And we have to hold on to what is right. We have to hold on to what we've been taught. We have to hold on to what the Bible says and be stable in our faith. But I want you to look at verse 4. And here he says, I, I am concerned, I'm worried that someone will delude you with persuasive words. Now, these false teachers they weren't more knowledgeable than Timothy or Epaphroditus or certainly Paul. They weren't more knowledgeable than some of the teachers that were teaching the truth there in Colossae, but they presented as if they were. They acted as if they were, according to their attitude. Their knowledge really wasn't real. Their wisdom wasn't real or of God, but they were such smooth talkers that people believed it was. And you know, I wish that wasn't the case, but it is, it is often the case that the one who is the smoothest talker um, has the more powerful voice, who is the best debater, often wins the debate. I remember a debate years ago, many years ago, that I watched online, 
And it was a brother in Christ in this debate against someone else, and it was over matters of salvation. Uh, I think in particular baptism and the necessity of baptism. And, you know, it was really interesting about that. Just I was with a group of people watching it, and, and not everyone was a member of the church. And what was really interesting about that was the brother in Christ was just so humble, and his heart was right, but just in his presentation, he wasn't maybe the speaker that the other fellow was. It just didn't seem to come as natural to him. And he would pause and take a little bit longer time to look at his notes or uh, maybe think about what he was about to say. Whereas the other guy was very quick on his feet and just had, you know, kind of a way with words and a great sounding voice and just just his presentation, his posture, his manner, just everything, you know, presented is very strong and charismatic. And, and you know, if you just, if you just listen, if you really just, I would even say read. If you just read, you know, without seeing, without hearing, if you just read the words of that debate, it's a slam dunk as far as I, I was concerned. Uh, I mean, the brother in Christ, he made such a solid case why baptism was necessary for salvation. I mean, slam dunk. But it was so interesting to me that people that didn't share my understanding, that they were more persuaded by this other individual because he was the more persuasive talker. And you know, that still happens today. There are a lot of false teachers in our world that say some things that are just so contrary to the Word of God, directly opposed to the Word of God. But they're very persuasive. And so many people believe in what they say. And that's what Paul was dealing with. He says, I'm worried you'll be deluded by persuasive arguments. And by the way, do you know what the word deluded means? I'll look that up. And I was kind of curious. And delude means to impose a misleading belief on someone. It's very similar to the word ludicrous, which is related to the word ridiculous. So the idea is that, you know, they might persuade you to believe something that's really ridiculous, but they make the argument so convincing and they're so persuasive and so charismatic that you might fall prey to that and believe it anyway. That was his concern. Again, you know, the church in Colossae was being attacked. False teachers were coming in and spreading Gnosticism. It was spreading like wildfire in the first century church. And so he's trying to commend them for remaining in the faith and, and being stable and strong, but also warning them about what's to come. Okay, let's look at verses 6 and 7, if you will. He says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith, just as you are instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Again, a little encouragement with them, uh, with them there for them to walk the walk, to really live that life. And, you know, the best way to, to prove something we believe is to live it, right? The best way to prove what we believe about life in Christ is to go out and live it and, and so prove it to the world, prove it to our friends, prove it to our neighbors, prove it to those who are closest to us, even prove it to ourselves and confirm our own faith and our own hearts. So he's encouraging them. He says, as you have received it, so walk it. And listen to this, be firmly rooted. You know, that's kind of alluding to some of the things that Jesus would talk about when he would talk about the seed of faith being implanted in the human heart and taking root so that difficulties may come, storms may come, but it doesn't get that plant, that seed that is beginning doesn't become uprooted or the seed stolen away, but it's taken root and it's going to be there. He says, so be firmly rooted and built up. That's the idea of growth. You know, that the word is planted in our hearts, it's there, it's strong, our convictions are strong, but then we're growing spiritually in the Lord. He says, you walk this, being firmly rooted and built up in him and established in your faith. 
established, if I understand it correctly here in the Greek, it's, it's kind of this idea about being so firmly rooted and so built up and growing and going in that direction that it's just like, this is who I am. And, and this is my life. I, I've established that this is why I'm here, and this is what I'm trying to live for. This is my goal. It's just this idea that this has become an established part of my life, right? So, he says this as his desire for them to remain faithful, even against the threats, against the faith there at present. But now look at verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and according to the elementary principles of the world rather than Christ. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit here. He's worried that they will become enslaved by this false doctrine. And I guess Gnosticism and maybe false doctrine in general. Certainly we use that language to talk about sin. It's enslaving. He was worried that they would become shackled and lose their freedom in Christ if they were to give in to this false doctrine and also be led into sin. And that's what he means when he says, See to it that no one takes you captive. But then he says, notice that they could take you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, or through elementary principles of the world. Well, what's philosophy? It's this idea that there are concepts that are out there drawn from various sources, right? Philosophy that explains things about life, things about us things about relationships from a human perspective, based upon a human understanding of things, not from the divine word or divine understanding. And, you know, occasionally there are things that are said in philosophy that are, wow, they're right, and they're true, and they're good, and we benefit from those things. But I think Paul is saying here that these false teachers, this wasn't a message from God. But it was a message very much based upon human thinking. And he says, you're going to come to a point where you're going to have to evaluate this and decide who are you going to trust more, human thinkers or God and his word. And then he uses this phrase, uh, he, he, by the way, he calls philosophy their philosophy, empty deception, which is according to the traditions of men. And then he says this thing about the elementary principles of the world, that a lot of their teaching was based on the elementary principles of the world. Again, there's a whole lot about Gnosticism that we just don't know. We just don't understand. As I was reading, um, one of the things I came across was, we do know that Gnosticism had something to do with elevating angels and the worship of angels. That they were almost lifting up angels close to the place that Christ deserved in their minds and in their hearts. And maybe the elements, elementary principles here, has something to do with this. Someone said that there was a belief at that time that angels somehow controlled the basic elements. Things like fire and rain and thunder, etc. And, and that so you, you worshipped angels so that, I, I guess, hopefully they would be good to you and you wouldn't experience these elements and, and be struck by lightning or have your crop ruined or, you know, something else, that you, you worship these angels. Of course, that was idolatrous thinking, really. Idolatrous thinking. But again, these false teachers, it just shows you as Paul begins to lift the cover and to look underneath at what these, these teachings were made of, he says... Their teachings based on elementary principles of the world and, and the things they're trying to admonish you to do and the ways they're encouraging to, you to live, they're, they're based on human traditions. And he says, this is human philosophy. 
human philosophy. You know, what did Paul say about human philosophy? Paul says this, of course, in 1 Corinthians. He's talking about human philosophy and about human thinking. And he says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And listen how he closes this section. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, he's kind of pointing out that the world through its own wisdom was never going to understand God or have a relationship with God along the lines of what we have in Christ. They were never going to find salvation. They were never going to please God and how we worship and so forth. That's worldly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom, the wisdom and teaching of God. All right, so now let's look at verses 9 through 15 and look at some reasons why Paul was encouraging them to hold on even more tightly to what they received about Christ himself. The first reason is, he says in verse 9, that Christ is divine. So if we look in our text in Colossians chapter 2, we read this, For in him... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All the fullness of deity. You can kind of take that a couple of different ways. Um, you can look at that in terms of that, um, I guess in terms of the fact that he's arguing the divinity of Jesus Christ, and he's trying to assure us that Jesus is fully God. Jesus was fully God. He was God come down in the flesh. That's what he means when he says in bodily form. But you know, not only did Jesus embody every characteristic of God, if God is holy, if God is merciful, if God is just, so is Jesus. And Jesus is just as holy and merciful and loving and just as God because he is God. But then it's also the idea that Jesus embodies everything every value, every thought, every bit of wisdom, every teaching of God. He is God in its fullness. In its fullness. Wow. And I guess what he's trying to do is encourage them not to replace that Jesus in his fullness with something that was less, with something that was inferior. So now let's look at verse 10. And just the first part of verse 10 he says, and in him you have been made complete. In him you have been made complete. He's trying to help us understand that in Christ, really, we have everything we need. We don't need to be saved additionally. We don't need to receive a knowledge apart from Christ, apart from his word, apart from the Bible, right? We don't need a holiness that's higher than what Christ offers or leads us to, as if there's such a thing, right? He's encouraging us to understand that we are complete in Christ. We have everything that we need spiritually in Jesus. And then look at the second part of verse 10. He says, not only are we complete in him, but that he is the head over all rule and authority. That's just another way of saying as he's trying to lift up Christ 
encouraging them not, not to diminish or settle for an inferior version of Jesus. That, listen, Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings and the sovereign over everything. And if he's truly your Lord, keep him there. Keep him. Don't start worshiping angels. Don't believe in a Jesus that's less than what you've been taught. You believe in the Lord of lords and the King of kings and the sovereign who is over all. Now, as we go on to verses 11 through 15, Paul explains the most important reason why they should only follow the teachings of Jesus. It's because he's their Savior. He is their Savior, and so he goes back to describe their salvation and what happened at their salvation, and perhaps to combat something that the Judaizing teachers, these Gnostics, were encouraging them to do. It appears that they were saying, among other things, that uh, to these Gentile Christians, you have to go back and be circumcised. You're not holy. You're not right with God. You're never going to have the relationship I have if you are not circumcised. And what Paul's trying to help them understand is that we received actually something better, and that was a spiritual circumcision. And he helps them understand where and when we received that spiritual circumcision. Let's read verses 11 and 12 as we start uh, the rest or the end of this passage. Verses 11 and 12 read, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So, fleshly circumcision was a symbol of God's covenant with Abraham. All the males, eight days old, would be circumcised. And that was to signify that they belonged and they were a part of this covenant that God, would made, that God had made with Abraham and his people. It seems, again, like these Gnostics, these Judaizing teachers, were coming in and saying, you know, this is the badge to show that we're of God, and you don't have it. And if you don't have it, that means you're inferior, and that you need to change, and you need to do this. And Paul says, you know what, though? You were. You were circumcised. When were we circumcised? He says, at baptism. <clears throat> now, notice, it was not a circumcision of the flesh but it's one that was spiritual. Just as with circumcision of the flesh, there is a cutting away of a portion of flesh. He says something else at baptism was cut away. And you know what was cut away? The old nature, uh, the old man of sin. That old part of you that wanted not to serve God, but wanted to do things that were wrong, wanted to rebel against the will of God, he says, that's what was cut away, spiritually speaking in baptism. That was your spiritual circumcision. And then let's read verses 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Do you notice he says, what, what proof do you have? What proof do you have that at baptism you were forgiven of your sins and you received a spiritual circumcision as a sign that you are a part of this covenant with God today? He says, you know what uh, the proof of that is? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, you look to that. That was your proof that you're saved. That was your proof that you're forgiven. That was your proof that you're a part of this covenant, the covenant of Christ. And then, look with me in verse 15, as we conclude this lesson. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display over them, having triumphed over them through him. So, I think Paul, in one statement, in such a beautiful way, talks about how God triumphed over the wisdom of men, over all the rulers and leaders, through Jesus. When he lifted up Christ, he lifted up himself and his way for all time. 
you know, thank you, and I'm looking forward to next week's lesson that picks up right there with verse 15. But why don't we go to our Heavenly Father now and close out this time with prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for blessing us and being with us during this time. I'm grateful for all those who are participating in this class and watching it online. And Father God, you blessed us and being able to now have a couple of times when we're assembling together, but also to assemble together this way. And Father, I know I've been blessed by it. I've benefited from it. And Pippi and I have just really enjoyed these lessons. And I just pray that you Father God, bless us as we have many more and, and reach out to people and, and just teach your word faithfully and help us to really take this message to heart and to lift up Christ in our hearts, to give him the place that he should have always. Help us to never settle for an inferior view of Christ, but to revere in our hearts the Lord, our Savior, the Jesus whom you sent. Father, we're so grateful, and we ask that you bless us, and it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, again, thanks for joining us for this time of Bible study, and as I always say, be well.